Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Industrial Gases Hydrogen. Before going into the today's lecture, what we are going to see? We are going to say a kind of recapitulation of what we have seen in last couple of classes. We have discussed a few basics of industrial gases. What are the industrial gases? Why are they being produced? Etc. Those fundamental aspects we have seen. And then we have seen uh, some applications of uh, these industrial gases as well. Then you know cryogenic engineering, how much it is essential from the industrial gases production point of view, especially in the uh, liquids and solid forms, etc. Those things we have seen. We have seen a few applications of uh, cryogenic engineering as well, uh, not only pertaining to the industrial gases, but also in general. Then we have seen the production of uh, oxygen and nitrogen. Under the production of oxygen and nitrogen, we have seen methods of production, flow charts and process descriptions, what are the major engineering problems, then economics of this oxygen and nitrogen that is the conception pattern of uh, these two gases also we have seen. right? Then further what we have studied, we have seen production of carbon dioxide, rather production recovery of carbon dioxide that is what we have seen because we know that this is produced uh, in many of the industrial uh, gases production or other processes. So, it is a kind of recovery of carbon dioxide by different approaches those things we have seen. For that two important methods of productions we have seen and then we have seen corresponding flow charts along with the process description. Okay? In today's lecture we are going to discuss about the hydrogen as industrial gas. It is very important gaseous raw material for many chemical and petrochemical industries. For example, some simple example like you know wherever you have a hydrogenation reaction or hydro treatment you have to do then uh, definitely this hydrogen is required from the industrial point of view if you see from chemical engineering point of view. right? Not only for hydrogenation but also some other chemicals production like you know ammonia synthesis let us say. So, like that there are uh, several application that this uh, hydrogen gas is having in uh, chemical and petroleum industries. Okay? It has applications both in gaseous and liquid forms, but however production and then subsequent storage in liquid form is more profitable from the industry point of view. Liquid hydrogen is shipped by tanker, truck or barge. Gaseous hydrogen is in general shipped in tube trailers. However, there are other hydrogen storage kind of uh, methods available like metal hydrates are used as hydrogen sponge right? for storing hydrogen. In the metal hydrates they can be stored compactly at moderate pressures because hydrogen is very dangerous so then it is obviously not preferable to store in very high pressure conditions so it is better to store them in moderate pressure conditions. So that way these metal hydrates are you know better option nowadays. Metal hydrates required only 2 mega Pascal of uh, pressure for storing, whereas if the same thing if you wanted to store in hydrogen cylinders then 14 mega Pascal pressure is required 7 times higher. So that is the reason people prefer to have a metal hydrates as hydrogen sponge for the storing this hydrogen. Okay? What kind of uh, metal hydrates are often used for the storing of hydrogen like uh, magnesium nickel? iron titanium, lanthanum nickel, mixed metal nickel etc. These kind of you know metal hydrates have been used or being uh, generated or lot of research is also going on in this area to develop newer kind of material for the storage of uh, hydrogen. We have seen like in the previous slide that you know we know that it is used as a raw material for production of several chemicals in uh, many of the chemical and then uh, petroleum industries. Right? Not only hydrogenation reaction or hydro treatment reaction, but also for the production of other chemicals also it is uh, used. So, what we do now? We see a few examples and then quantity of uh, hydrogen required uh, you know, so that to have a kind of feel how much it is essential and then quantitatively also how much quantity is required for a given kind of production that we are going to see in a tabular form now. Okay? Let us say phenol you have, if you hydrogenate it then you get cyclohexanol. Right? So, how much hydrogen is required at 150 degree centigrade? By the way, this hydrogenation reaction usually occurs at sufficiently higher temperature, but uh, very large pressure, higher pressure only in general they occur for majority of the reactions if not for all. 
right. So, the pressure has to be higher so that the hydrogenation take place in general if not for all reactions, right. For each reaction the optimum temperature and uh, pressure and catalyst etcetera uh, for a optimum production of a product uh, those things depends on the product to product reaction to reaction. So, we cannot generalize we cannot compare. So, let us say if you do these reactions at 150 degree centigrade and then see how much phenol is required then you can say from phenol to cyclohexanol if you are uh, producing 787 cubic meters are required ok. Let us say if you wanted to produce ammonia uh, by reacting nitrogen with the hydrogen then 2645 cubic meters are required and then if you wanted to produce tetraline from naphthalene by hydrogenating naphthalene then 378 cubic meters are required. If you want to produce stearine from olins then 82 cubic meters of uh, hydrogen required at 150 degree centigrade. If you wanted to produce isooctane from diisobutylene then 1600 cubic meters are required. Whereas, if you wanted to produce methanol from carbon monoxide by hydrogenation reaction then 1715 cubic meters of hydrogen is required, ok. So, now you can see how much hydrogen is required even we have listed only 4 5 equations here only there are n number of equations. So, how much hydrogen required is you know one it is very clear, ok. Huge amount of hydrogen required for uh, many of this chemical and then petroleum industry related uh, reactions, ok. Now, we see hydrogen manufacture. The basic method to produce hydrogen is by decomposition of the carbonaceous material because carbonaceous materials in general they have C, H and O. There may be other uh, inorganic elements may also be there in that one carbonaceous matter, but in any given carbonaceous uh, material. However, the C, H and O are going to be primary components uh, you know constituents of any carbonaceous material. So, that is the primary resource. It is derived almost exclusively from carbonaceous materials, ok. So, raw materials obviously hydrocarbons and or water. Hydrocarbons if you decompose then obviously some gases flue gases would be coming that may be having CO, CO2, H2, CH4 and all that. So, CH2 may be recovered like that, ok. Raw materials are decomposed by application of certain kind of energy that energy can be electrical energy, chemical energy or even thermal energy, ok. Now, we see some of the important methods of production of hydrogen electrolysis of water, steam reforming of hydrocarbons, partial oxidation of hydrocarbons, thermal dissociation of natural gas, steam iron processes, water gas and producer gas processes which have been already discussed, separation from cocoa and gas and refinery of gas streams. So, here some of the process we have already discussed the ones which are highlighted in red color font those things we have already discussed. Let us say steam reforming of hydrocarbons we have studied you know while discussing the synthesis gases production. We have discussed steam reforming of hydrocarbons and partial oxidation of hydrocarbons in the chapter on fuel gases, right. So, when you do naphtha or any other kind of uh, relevant hydrocarbons if you do the steam reforming or partial oxidation you get a flue gases. So, they mostly comprise of CO, H2 and then CO2, right. So, different depending on the process and then temperature, pressure condition etcetera their composition may vary. Not only these three, but other components may also be there including the hydrocarbons if the complete uh, reaction does not take place. So, that is also possible, right. So, but primarily these are the ones which will be having the higher composition, right. So, CO2 we know that this is usually removed by MEA process or uh, Girbatol process that is monoethanol amine solutions we used for absorption of the CO2, right. Once the CO2 is being absorbed in that particular solution, that solution is reheated to uh, separate out CO2 and then uh, regenerate the absorption solvent. That solvent would be recirculated to the you know absorption column. This we have seen, right. So, then in order to remove the CO what we have done? We have done a water gas shift reaction to convert 
this CO into CO2 plus H2, right? Then again that CO2 is removed by any of the uh, uh, absorption process that we have seen. So then primarily H2 only be remaining. There may be traces of CO or uh, other impurities. Then again we have a hot concentrated potassium chromate solution, absorption, etc. those kind of things we use and then further purify. Right? So, that is what we have seen like you know depending on whether your product is H2 plus CO or only H2 or producing estaline etc other kind of thing those kind of alternative options were there while we were discussing these chapters. Right? So, then those things we have already seen so then we are not going to repeat again. Right? Same is true for the other things like water gas and producer gas processes, recovery from or separation from coke oven gas and then uh, those things we have already seen. So, the remaining things we try to see now in this particular lecture. Okay? So, let us start with electrolysis of water. So, electrolytic method. It produces high purity hydrogen and not only for this process, electrolysis processes in general are good for a high quality, high purity uh, you know production. High purity products if you wanted to get and then if it is possible to do electrolysis then better to go for the electrolysis. But the problem uh, with this such kind of processor that they are expensive and then small capacities only you can do such kind of disadvantages would be there. So, those things also we are going to see anyway. So, here also the same is true, it produces high purity hydrogen. Okay? This method consists of uh, passing direct current through an aqueous solution of alkali and decomposing water according to the reaction 2 H2O liquid giving rise to 2 H2 gas and then 1 O2 gas with delta H 5, 16 and kilojoules which indicate this reaction is endothermic and required lot of energy. So, now this process is electrolytic process, so then energy has to be provided through electrical means. The energy should be provided through electrical means. So, how much voltage is required for this reaction to occur in order to get H2 from water by electrolysis that is theoretically 1.23 volts at standard temperature pressure conditions. Right? However, there are certain kind of issues like you know over voltage issues and then uh, cell resistance also because these are done in the uh, uh, form of cells in as in compartments. So, then uh, resistance of the cell itself may be having some kind of additional voltage requirement. Because of that one the required you know in reality whatever the voltage that should be provided for this reaction to occur that is very much higher compared to the theoretical decomposition voltage. How much it is in general between 2 to 2.25 volts because of over voltage of hydrogen on electrodes and resistance of cell itself. Okay? Commercial cell that electrolyzes 15 percent of NaOH solution in general in such kind of uh, commercial cells what are the electrodes and then uh, those details we are going to see now here. Iron cathode is used whereas the anode is nickel plated iron. Okay? And then electrode compartments are separated by asbestos diaphragm, often operates at 60 to 70 degree centigrades and then whatever the nickel plating has been done on the anode that reduces the oxygen over voltage as well. Okay? So, that is the advantage of having the uh, nickel plating on the anode. Okay? Many cells produces in general 56 liters of hydrogen and 28 liters of oxygen per megajoule of electrical energy that is supplied to the process. If you supply 1 megajoule of electrical energy for the process to get the hydrogen, how much you get? 56 liters of hydrogen and 28 liters of oxygen you get. Uh, in such kind of processes often this oxygen is uh, wasted it, or it is not recovered or stored until and unless it is useful on site, but most often it is wasted. Product gas whatever you get that is 99.7 percent pure H2 and it is even suitable for hydrogenating edible oils. Such high purity is more than sufficient for hydrogenating many of the edible oils. Cells are important in this electrolysis process, so it is essential to know how many types of cells are uh, in general available. Two important types of cells are available, one is bipolar or filter press type cells where each plate is an individual cell. Another one is unipolar or tank type uh, containing two anode compartment cells with a cathode compartment between them. Right? Unipolar cells may be open or closed tanks. In many installations 
O2 produced is wasted until and unless it can be used locally wherever this H2 is produced. H2 is also produced from other electrolytic processes such as electrolysis of salt brain solution etc. So, that is about a few basic details about a electrolysis process to produce hydrogen. Okay? There are many technical engineering aspects are there, but that are those things are not important from the course point of view. So, but that is the reason we are not discussing them. Now, we see second method coal gasification process. As we already know now that carbonaceous materials are you know sources or raw material for production of uh, hydrogen by different methods. You may be decomposing carbonaceous material by applying the energy, energy in different forms like electrical energy, thermal energy or chemical energy to get the hydrogen because this carbonaceous material mainly composing of C, H and O so that H may be you can recover somehow. Right? So, natural gas and then uh, hydrocarbons are being depleting very faster. So, because of such reasons you know nowadays coal has been considered as a uh, resource for uh, hydrogen production. Okay? So, that is the reason now we see coal gasification process to get hydrogen. Actually coal gasification can be done for many other products also like you know for other uh, synthesis gas productions etc. also one can do. Fine. It can also be done for the uh, you know combustion purpose also usually people use for you know electricity production etc. those things also there. But now the coal gasification we are doing only in order to produce H2 accordingly we see discussions. Gaseous and liquid hydrocarbon feedstock reserves are depleting fast because of that reason coal as source of hydrogen receiving much importance these days. So, if you take coal as a basic raw material and then see how to get the hydrogen from it or you have to see the reactions of coal gasification. What are the reactions that may often occur in coal gasification? That is gasification reaction. Gasification is nothing but reacting with the steam. Okay? When you react the coal with steam you get CO plus H2. Then because of the water gas shift reaction the CO may be reacting with the steam again to give CO2 plus H2. This reaction is controlled to give CO divided by H2 is equals to 1 by 3. That is 1 mole of CO if you are reacting here under water gas shift reaction you should get 3 moles of H2 such a way that the conditions has to be maintained. Then Bordard reaction where coal reacts with the CO2 to give carbon monoxide this carbon monoxide will again react with the steam to get carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Right? So, now what we have we are already having H2 right? under this gasification process if the conditions are such a way that the pressure is very high then whatever this H2 is produced that will hydrogenate some of the carbon to form methane. Okay? but you do not want methane to be formed. But however, it is possible without your uh, you know willingness if you maintain the pressure high. So, you should not maintain high pressure because as I already mentioned hydrogenation reaction most of the hydrogenation reaction temperature may be moderate, but the pressure has to be high. Right? If the pressure is high, so then whatever the hydrogen is present in the system that will be hydrogenating the other components, other carbonaceous material also. Okay? So, let us say C plus H2 giving rise to CH4 is one possibility. CO which is already formed because of the gasification that again getting hydrogenated in the presence of uh, appropriate catalyst to give CH4 and then water is forming. Right? So, like this uh, you know different options are there. So, then different reactions may be there. So, then this CH4 whatever is there earlier it was known as synthetic natural gas, but synthetic and then natural or you know contradictory words. So, then people started calling it substitute natural gas SNG. Okay? But however, our interest is not this one as far as this lecture is concerned, our interest is this one only. So, what we have to do? We have to reduce the pressure or we have to maintain the pressure as much low as possible in gasification process so that there is no hydrogenation taking place. Only uh, gasification, maybe some combustion pyrolysis you cannot avoid them anyway, even if you maintain low pressure. So, you know, but at least you can avoid hydrogenation, so methane formation would be less. Operating range of P and T in the gasifier are 
Atmospheric pressure to 6.9 mega Pascals are the pressure condition ranges and then 800 to 1650 degree centigrade the temperature conditions in the uh, gasifier. As I mentioned already high pressure and then lower temperature results in formation of larger amount of methane. So what you have to do? You have to maintain low pressure and then high temperature so that gasification reaction, these reactions primarily take place but not these ones. Okay? Now we see Wellman two stage coal gasifier process, this is a process here. So what we have? We have a gasifier which is also known as the producer. Okay? It is a continuous process, to this reactor coal is continuously fed. Actually in this reactor required temperature and pressure are maintained as per the reaction. If you wanted to produce SNG then pressure is maintained high and then temperature is maintained low. If you want to avoid formation of methane or you want more gasification and combustion to take place then you maintain low pressure and high temperature. The same reactor may be used for the production of both hydrogen as well as the SNG. Okay? To this reactor which is at certain desired temperature and pressure, you are allowing steam to enter. right? The steam you are getting by applying the boiler water in a steam drum so that the steam would get generated and that steam you can pass it to the uh, uh, gasifier or what you can do if the produced steam is not sufficient enough you can take external steam and then make up along with the air and then send it to the reactor or gasifier along with the air and steam both together you can feed in depending on what reaction you are preferring to have. If you preferring to have some combustion reaction also along with the gasification then you can allow air. But if you are preferring only uh, gasification primarily then you do not supply air, only steam you supply. Okay? So when this reaction takes place there are two types of gases would be evolved, top gases, bottom gases okay? and then ash would be forming at the bottom that would be collected as a bottom product from the bottom of the gasifier continuously. This reactor is a continuous one. Top gases are you know which are more volatile and then can uh, raise to the top of the column even at low temperature those gases. So those gases whether it is top gases or bottom gases when they are coming out of the reactor which is uh, operating between 800 to 1600 degree centigrade roughly as per uh, requirement. So obviously the outlet gases would be at high temperature, the temperature would be controlled by passing it through hydraulic seal. Then top gases are allowed to pass through d tarer where tar is removed and then top gases are further sent to tubular cooler so that further cooling of these gases can take place to room temperature or atmospheric temperature conditions. The bottom gases that are coming out of this uh, reactor they are also at high temperature and they may also be containing some uh, lighter hydrocarbon so then they, those things has to be uh, removed and then the gases has to be cooled down for that water, wash water is used actually. Right? In the settling vessel, see uh, whatever the impurities that are dissolved in the water, they will be collected in the settling vessel and then they will be taken as a residues. These residues are also not kind of wastage, they are having so many organic constituents that can be used for uh, production of other chemicals. Because any carbonaceous material is a kind of a pool of wealth, you can produce so many things. Okay? The bottom gases are you know they are further sent to the tubular cooler to further reduce the temperature and then mixed with the top gases and then sent to de-oiler. De-oiler are some kind of uh, adsorption columns something like glycerin etc are uh, provided here to remove traces of uh, gases like you know H2S, CO etc are in some light hydrocarbons will also be absorbed by these oils right? and then spent oil is collected from the bottom. right? So, cold clean gases are collected from the top. These gases would be consisting of hydrogen primarily but in addition to that one CO and then CO2 may also be there. So one has to further do the purification steps. So what type of purification steps are possible that we are going to see once again anyway. Some of them we have already seen previously. Okay? So once uh, you do the purification you get the hydrogen as per required purification standard that you follow. 
Now, as I was mentioning in the gasification reaction, not only H2 formation, CO, CO2 formation, methane formation, etc., would also be taking place. So, all that depends on the temperature and pressure conditions. So, it is important to understand what kind of reactions are occurring across the different cross section or uh, different uh, heights of the you know gasifier, that is what we are going to see now. So, this cut view of the same uh, gasifier shown here. So, it is having three zones, one is the combustion zone which is at the bottom at which the temperatures are very high temperatures, very high temperatures. Then just above that one there is a uh, gasification zone, the temperatures are still high. Then above that one there is a pyrolysis zone that is not shown here, then above that one there is a distillation zone where the temperatures are nominal like nominal in the sense between 150 to 200 degree centigrade something like that. From the coal is coming here, this is a coal feeder. Inside this uh, gasifier we are maintaining certain temperature and pressure as per our product requirement. So, now here we want more hydrogen, so low pressure and then high temperatures are being maintained. Some reaction would be taking place, whatever the upper gas would be there that is the top gases top gases in the sense which are more volatile and quickly rises to the top of the column. So, those taken out from the vent of here whereas, the lower gases or bottom gases are taken off from just above the gasification zone from here. Okay? Whatever the ash is, is there that is collected in the ash pan and then discarded continuously. This process goes on continuously. Now, if you see the reactions point of view, what kind of reactions are occurring? The same thing is pictorially shown here actually. And so, now we have a combustion zone, we have a gasification zone, pyrolysis zone and distillation zone. So, coal whatever is there, it is a carbonaceous material. So, then we have carbon, ash, tar, oils, moisture, etc. all of them would be present here. So, in distillation zone temperature is maintained between 120 to 150 degree centigrade, sometimes up to 200 degree centigrade. So, that when this uh, distillation zone operated a certain range of temperatures, the some of the oils, moisture, etc. are collected from the top. Remaining are mostly hydrocarbons after that, you know, that can be those hydrocarbons may be represented as CNHM, that may be you can write as CH4 plus C plus H plus TARS, etc. So, here the temperature from this onwards uh, to the towards the upper ones is between 500 to 600 degree centigrade temperature is maintained, right. So, that uh, pyrolysis takes place and then some methanes etc. are also forming along with other gases. So, this zone is known as the pyrolysis zone, right. So, these are you know some of the zones are you know intermixing with respect to the temperature because these zones you know they, they have represented with respect to the temperature of operation, right. Okay. So, this is the pyrolysis zone which is operating at 500 to 600 degree centigrade and then from here the lower gases are taking off. Further temperature, higher temperature you can see further uh, lower section of the gasifier which operates around 1000 to 1100 degree centigrade. Here most of the reactions are producing CO, H2, CO2 kind of products that you can see. Okay. So, now what you see in gasification zone mostly you are getting H2, H2, CO, CO2. So, CO2 you can remove by the uh, MEA process, garbitol process and then CO you can convert to the H2 plus CO2 by water gas shift reaction and then you can do similar analysis. If you maintain, that is possible if you maintain the temperature less than 1100 or 1000 degree centigrade, something like that and pressure is low pressure, not the high pressure, right. But however, if you further increase the temperature then more combustion kind of reactions are taking place where primarily you get CO2 and CO only. Okay? So, ash is collected at the bottom. Now, what you can see some of these zones are intersecting that is because the range of temperature at which these are working, it is not very specified like you know up between 500 to 600, it is a 100 degree centigrade range. Okay? So, like this now the Combustion may also occur at uh, 1100 degree centigrade and 1000 degree centigrade as well. So, at that temperature gasification is primarily occurring. So, these kind of you know sections are there at which you know either of the process, I mean you cannot distinguish them as a specifically combustion zone or gasification zone, a kind of buffer zones are present in between uh, these zones. 
Okay. So, this is what about you know uh, gasification, coal gasification process. So, here we are getting CO, H2 and then CO2 mixture. There may be methane and other kind of impurities are there. So, that purification etc. you can do. This you can take out by MEA process. This you convert to CO2 plus uh, H2 by water gas shift reaction and then this again you remove by MEA process or any other suitable process. Now, after that you almost uh, you know H2 would be there in the flue gas because these gases whatever are there you have to process them for subsequently for this kind of removal. This removal and then water gas shift reaction how to do that we have already discussed and then removal of CO2 that we have already studied further conversion of CO to CO2 and H2 that also we have seen how to do right. Then after that only almost pure H2 is there if at all any traces of CO, CO2, methane etc are there how to remove them those things also we have seen in the previous week when we were discussing about the fuel gases. So, we are not repeating them, but in addition to these purification methods there are additional purification methods are also there those things we are going to see anyway in today's lecture. Now, we go to the next method cracked ammonia process. Cracked ammonia process is basically if you wanted to tell about it in one single line. So, you take the ammonia liquid and then vaporize it and then apply high temperature 800 degree centigrade or something like that and then whatever the gases are there that you pass through a suitable catalyst. So, then ammonia will be decomposed into nitrogen and then hydrogen. Right. So, you got this hydrogen because nitrogen is anyway mostly inert for most of the applications. Okay. That is what nothing but the cracked ammonia process. However, we see steps again here as well. By cracking or thermal dissociation of ammonia, a mixture of N2 and H2 can be prepared in 1 is to 3 ratio by volume. Final gas mixture can be used for hydrogenation as well because N2 is inert anyway. Cracking process include following steps, vaporizing the liquid ammonia from cylinders because ammonia is filled in uh, cylinders usually that you have to vaporize, then heating it to 870 degree centigrade, then passing it over an active catalyst, then cooling it in heat exchangers where incoming gas is vaporized. So, by this process you can get H2 and N2. Okay. So, how much amount of H2 you get by this process if you wanted to see? Let us say a single 68 kg cylinder of anhydrous ammonia uh, you take and then do this process you get 190 meter cube of cracked ammonia. Cracked ammonia is nothing but decomposed one that is in form of H2 and N2. So, this is equivalent to contents of about 33 hydrogen cylinders. right? If you take 68 kg of anhydrous ammonia then you get 33 hydrogen cylinders quantitatively. This is cracked ammonia process. Now, what we do? We have a comparison of hydrogen production alternatives. We have seen different methods uh, that are available now including steam reforming, coal gasification, electrolysis, etc. So, we have a comparison from engineering point of view. Engineering point of view several things should be there. So, these things are efficiency you have to see. Then uh, environmental impact you have to see advantages, disadvantages, etc. and then production cost, etc. All of these things are important from industrial viewpoint, right? So, then those things we are going to discuss for each and every for a four important processes. What are they? Steam reforming of hydrocarbons, coal gasification, electrolysis and thermochemical decomposition processes. What are we going to see under each process? We are going to see approximate thermal efficiency, how much state of art, environmental effects, advantages, disadvantages and then estimated H2 production cost. Steam reforming of uh, hydrocarbons is the best approach that is available. Its efficiency is also very high 70 percent and it is a well known technology that is already being implemented in majority of industries. Environmental impacts obviously natural gas or hydrocarbons naphtha etc are being used for the reforming so that to get synthesis gas or hydrogen gas. So, they will be depleting apart from that there is no other environmental effect anyway. Advantages if you see this is currently cheapest method that is available for production of a synthesis gas and hydrogen gas. 
Disadvantages is uh, CH4 supply issues are there because of that one, scant long term potential is there, right. Estimated H2 production cost per gigajoule of product as a 1980 if you see 7.17 dollars only, okay. Coming to the coal gasification, efficiency is still better 60 to 65 percent and then it is also mature technology that is available. Environmental effects since you need coal, coal mining has to be done and then impacts of coal mining whatever are there they will all be considered here also as environmental effects. Air pollution would obviously be there if you are uh, using coal whether you are doing gasification, combustion, pyrolysis whatever you do. But however, here in this uh, process to get hydrogen from coal gasification pollution is less compared to that uh, electricity from coal when you try to produce, okay. It is also cheapest and then best next to the steam reforming process, okay. Disadvantages, limitation is exhaustion of coal resources, coal resources are already depleting very fast. So if you also produce hydrogen from the coal they will be further faster depleting. But the plant size is very big this coal gasification that is one issue. Estimated production cost is 10.02, slightly higher compared to the steam reforming. Electrolysis, its efficiency is very low 30 to 21 to 25 depending on what type of electrolyte solution you are using. It is a proven and reliable technology of course, pollution problems may be there with electricity generation. The advantages is that it is a small plant size, you do not need big setup for that, big big plants are not required. It can also use non fossil fuel, but the disadvantages are the production cost is very high, high cost, production cost itself is 21.05 that is too much high compared to the other two processes. Low net energy efficiency that we have seen, not even half of what it is uh, by steam reforming. So these are the disadvantages. Coming to thermochemical decomposition, efficiency is less than 55 that is maximum 55 percent is attained and then it is still at recess stage. Coming to the environmental effects, high efficiency means less resources use and possible release of harmful chemicals are the issues. They can also use non fusel fuel and then materials problems in reactant containment and then large complex plant is another issue. The estimated production costs we cannot evaluate because it is at research stage. So this is a kind of comparison if you are producing hydrogen by four different methods. So what you can understand from all these five bullet points shown here that is in terms of efficiency, state of art, environmental impacts, advantages, disadvantages and then production costs from all these point of view steam reforming is a better option for the production of hydrogen as per the current existing technology available. Now we see hydrogen purification processes, CO removal, carbon monoxide removal. If CO is present in high concentration then it is converted to the hydrogen by water gas shift reaction that we know in presence of iron acid and then uh, when you react CO with the steam then what happens you will get uh, CO2 plus H2, CO2 can be uh, removed by MEA solutions etc. So then you have the pure H2 only or high concentration H2 only you will be having, right. Remaining CO if at all that is present traces of CO still present they can be removed by scrubbing the mixture gas in solution of complex copper ammonium salts. So these steps also we have seen under steam reforming of hydrocarbon section when we are discussing about synthesis gas. So we are not discussing them again. If at all CO2 and then H2S are there, so many commercial processes are available, some of them we have already discussed like monoethanol amine solution or girbetol process that is absorption of CO2 in these solutions and then removing this uh, CO2 from the spent liquid by heating it those process, recovering MEA and then sending back to the absorption tower all those things we have seen. So we are not studying them again. Hot potassium carbonate process and then physical solvent processes are also there. Now adsorption purification process is another important uh, method that is available for purifying the hydrogen in the uh, gases mixture. So what are the different types of adsorption purification steps are available those things we are going to see now. 
For removing impurities such as CO2, H2O, methane, ethane, CO, AR, N2, etc. from impure hydrogen streams, fixed bed adsorption is often used. Right? There are two standard approaches for purification by adsorption. Fixed bed in the sense nothing but you know you have a column as we know already, uh, cylindrical column is there and then this column is packed with uh, some kind of packing material only certain portion of this one and then bottom and top are closed with a you know mesh. Okay? So, now the gases whichever you wanted to absorb they adsorbed on that one they should be passed through such kind of packed material. So, then the packing whatever is there that uh, onto that one this H2 would be adsorbed. And then later on once sufficient adsorption has been done because this material packing material is chosen such that adsorb only H2 if you are trying to purify H2 or if you are trying to remove other kind of impurities accordingly you have to select the materials packing material accordingly. H2 once it is adsorption equilibrium if it is achieved so further adsorption may not possible then what you can do you can stop the flow of H2 and then you do the deadsorption, desorption you do to recover the pure H2 from the packed material, okay? packing material whatever we have used for the packing. So, this can be done either by uh, pressure conditions or by temperature conditions. Based on that one, two approaches are there, thermal swing adsorption and pressure swing adsorption. In the thermal swing adsorption what happens? Adsorption of impurities is done at low temperatures. And then further desorption is favored by increasing the temperature and passing a non-adsorbable purge gas through the bed. The use of this purge gas is that you know it improve the desorption efficiency and then carry forward the desorbed gases from the bed as well. For that reason this purge gases are allowed while doing the desorption. While doing desorption only you use this purge gases. For continuous processes at least two beds are necessary, one bed would be on stream, the other one is being generated. Okay? Next is pressure swing adsorption PSA, here molecular sieves are used to adsorb impurities under the pressure, under pressure conditions what you do, you different types of molecular sieves have been developed. So, these molecular sieves are very good for adsorption of uh, different gases, so similarly hydrogen can be adsorbed. But when you use these molecular sieves for adsorption of certain kind of gases onto them, you have to use pressurized conditions. Desorption is often done at same temperature but at lower pressure. Temperature you maintain same temperature at which you are doing the adsorption, but the pressure you have to decrease substantially to desorb the hydrogen that is being adsorbed onto the molecular sieves. Okay? So, that is how it is done. So, first you have to adsorb, do the adsorption so that only because this material, the adsorption medium whatever is there, they are selected such a way that only hydrogen is being adsorbed on in those material. So, as much hydrogen as possible you adsorb first, once the equilibrium has attained then you stop the adsorption and then you apply the desorption conditions and then get the pure H2 only. Because while doing the desorption only H2 is present in the adsorption medium. right? Because while doing the adsorption only H2 is being adsorbed in the adsorption medium whereas the rest of the impurities are passed out while the adsorption itself. If required purge gas can also be used to facilitate desorption and at least two beds are required for continuous process here as well. Main advantage of this one PSA over uh, TSA is that shorter cycle time because cycle time in the sense adsorption followed by desorption. Once it is one cycle is complete, how much are you recovering and then what is the duration of cycle that will define you know economics not only from the in, uh, equipment uh, size wise but also from the operational cost wise. So, that uh, these two are very important, if the shorter cycle is there, so smaller uh, equipments can be used. Okay? And then if the equipment for the adsorption is smaller, so obviously adsorbent or you know adsorption medium requirement would also be less. PSA can purify crude hydrogen stream to high purity hydrogen product containing only 1 to 2 ppm of total impurities only. 
only this much of impurities are there. Such a good process is this PSA. Next purification approach is cryogenic liquid purification. It is used for a bulk removal of impurities often. How? Impure hydrogen stream is also partially purified by cooling to suitable cryogenic temperatures. How to define? Let us say you have this H2, CO, CO2, CH4, etc. These gases are there and these things are you know uh, your impurities. So, you have to select a temperature so that you know only these things should be condensed, not the other one. How you decide that one? That you can decide based on the vapor pressure of the impurities. Okay? So, that the impurities be condensed and separated as a liquid stream. This is often used for bulk removal of light hydrocarbons from hydrogen in refinery of gases. So, if you wanted to recover hydrogen from the refinery of gases, then cryogenic is a best option. Because a refinery of gases would also contain lot of hydrocarbons, lighter hydrocarbons as well along with the other impurities. Purity of product obtained obviously depends upon vapor pressure of the impurity. Impurities are not readily removable in most of the cases. Higher purification may obtained by further Linde cycles which remove low boiling contaminants in hydrogen gas stream at 2.1 mega Pascal and minus 180 degree centigrade by washing successively with uh, liquid methane to remove N2 and CO and then liquid propane to remove CH4. While removing N2 and CO it is possible that methane may also be coming along with the H2. Right? So, that methane should also be removed. So, then liquid propane is usually uh, used to remove this uh, methane, traces of methane from the mixture gas. Then you get more than 99.99 percent pure hydrogen. Final purification obtained by using activated carbon, silical gel and or molecular sieves depending on purity that you required. Low temperature for washing with liquid nitrogen or for fractionation are also used to remove impurities in general. So, that is all about uh, hydrogen production and then purification of hydrogen uh, or removing impurities from the gases mixture to get the pure hydrogen, how to do all that thing we have seen. Right? Some of the technologies, some of the uh, processes we have seen in the today's lecture and then some we have already previously seen. Coming to the references of this lecture, all these details may be found in these books, but this particular lecture has been prepared from this book. Chemical Process Industries by Austin and Shreve. Thank you.